Guests, panel guests, do you want to say anything to the people? Well, hey everyone, uh, my name is Danielle. I'm the host of Unplugged. Um, I also head up our um, women's group called Pursued um, and our mentoring and leadership group for middle school and high school age girls, Rubies, and then I work very closely with the I'm Worth the Wait campaign. All right, Ish, do you want to say something? Might as well, man. Hey everybody, my name is Ishmael Lowry. I'm the operations manager for Unplugged. I uh, pretty much head up the, uh, the volunteers. So also, if you want to get a uh, volunteer, if you want to be a volunteer, go see me. So, uh, but other than that, that's pretty much it. All right, Ms. Irwin, what's our first question? When is your second book coming out, and what inspirational books do you recommend someone to read? Okay. Uh, my book, uh, unfortunately, <clears throat> not unfortunately, when I was doing this series, I began to talk a little bit more. So all the stuff that I've added in this series, I want to add to the book as well. So prior to this series, I had some basic information. Now saying some of this new stuff that God has given me over the past few weeks, I'm going to push the book back a few months so I can add all the new material into it as well, which then is going to have to get edited again, all that good stuff. But a good book that I can suggest to people is uh, any Tim Keller book, Reasons for God, is a good book. Uh, for those people who are kind of uh, struggling with, 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 with God and creation and struggling with any type of questions. The Reason for God is a very good book by Tim Keller that will get you going. And in U12, that's the book that we're going to be reading as well. So if you men want to get plugged in and, and, and grow with your walk with God, we'll be reading through that together. Um, but uh, I also post on my Facebook other books. I'm going blank right now. But Tim Keller, Reasons for God is a good book. And Unplugged by Josh Azzi. But anyway, Tim Keller, <laughs> Reasons for God is a good book. You have any good books? Yeah, you Yeah. Anything by Tim Keller, uh, well, I'll put up a list on Facebook. Yep. Okay. Um, how do I keep suicide thoughts out of my head? That was it. Oh, it was three questions. Okay. Uh, how do I keep suicidal thoughts out of my head? You have to, because uh, <clears throat> I lived this. You know, I had suicidal thoughts growing up in my life. Two incidents where I was really contemplating getting out of here. Um, but the best way that I combated those suicidal thoughts is to remember that I actually have a purpose. See, I'm glad that I, my mom was, my, was the type of mom that she was. Um, she was a mom that always reassured me. I mean, <clears throat> my, my dad's African, my mom's a regular African-American woman. And, and my dad was gonna give me some like 40 letter long African name or something like that. Now mind you, my mom wasn't, my mom wasn't saved. Uh, my mom wasn't saved when she had me, so <clears throat> she knew about God. She used to be the type of mom, the women that she'll drive by the church and cut the music down. So she had a reverence about God, but it was no, you know, salvation. Yeah, I, I, God was pursuing her nonetheless. So my mom um, said an angel came into the room, and she didn't see it. It was just a presence in the room and said, I want you to call this young man Joshua, for he'll be a great leader. All that. My mom would tell a better story. You know, she'd be bragging about her baby. But anyway, she said, uh, I mean, she wasn't saved, and she said, Dixon, that's my dad's name, we're going to call him Joshua. So ever since I was a young age, I knew I had a call. I remember when, my, when I was four, my mom said, my mom was a smoker, so she will smoke a lot. And uh, she said I was sitting in the living room when I looked at her, and she just felt conviction. And I was just a, a three-year-old, four-year-old child. And she said she stopped smoking that day and started going to church. So when stuff like that happens, you know, you, you, you have some sense of purpose. Now, if you're a person that says, well, Josh, I don't have no purpose, then you have, to, you have to really find out why you exist. You have to find your purpose. And you have to first not even worry about your purpose first. You got to make sure you have a hope. Hope keeps you alive. Hope sustains you. See, when you put your hope in a person, when you put your hope in something tangible, hope, something temporal, when you put your hope in a relationship, when that relationship goes through different trials and things, situations, you lose hope in it. When you put your hope in a career, you may lose a job and lose all hope. When you put your hope in anything but God, it will come against that hope to the point where it will not be able to sustain you. But when your hope is in something eternal, when your hope is in something that's secure like God, it don't matter what tough things come, even when you got the gun in your lap or the knife in your hand, you can't because he is your hope. Now, hope is a supernatural thing that mankind cannot even desire to explain. But when you meet the God of the universe, you will understand the hope that lies within. So before you even think about the five steps of getting suicidal thoughts out of your mind, you have to first meet the God of the universe through Jesus Christ. You got to meet God Find out for yourself why does God exist and why is, this God in, why is this God trying to pursue you? And you can tell God is pursuing you by the fact that you've asked a question because something you was wanting to get out of this suicidal thought. So remember this, there's more reasons for you to live than there's reasons for you to die. There's more reasons for you to live 
then there's reasons for you to die. So understand that, grasp that, embrace life, even if life is not the best thing. Because, man, I grew up in, 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 some, in some life where it, it was not easy, especially when you call to be this preacher, you call to be this, this guy, you sing dreams of stadiums packed and all that kind of stuff, but you only seeing two or three people beginning this ministry. So you can't embrace life in, at what it is. Embrace life to what is to come. Embrace the life that you have now with God and trust that he'll get you there. So for suicidal thoughts, listen, it's a trick. Because if you kill yourself, you're letting, you, you telling the world and everyone know. You're letting everyone know that God is unable to redeem or get you out of anything. When you kill yourself, you're letting everyone know that God can't help you. But God may pre be prolonging it because there was moments in my life when I was in that car where I wanted to kill myself. That it's so, it's so funny in life. The biggest pressure comes right when you're this close to your breakthrough. When you're, I mean, I'm telling you, see, demons can see angels working on your behalf. Come on now. This is a spirit. It's more, it's more reality in the spirit world than the natural. You think this natural world is everything? No, 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 no. This, this place is packed full because you brought some demons in. I might have brought some stuff in. Your angels up in here too. And all this kind of stuff. So this room is so full of, of, different, of different things that you can't see. Molecules, atoms, neutrons, protons. So the invisible world is more evident than what you can see, hear, smell, taste, and touch. So with that being said, you got to understand that, that they can see angels working on your behalf. They know when they, they see, come on, now you think our communication system's good? You think our little cell phone, you think we high tech, now they got a Samsung phone that's, that is curved now? You think, we, well, you think we ahead of the curve? Come on now, the spiritual world's beyond the curve. So if they, they know how to communicate to ensure what's happening in your life. So what happens, dang, them angels about to bring her blessing like five days. They about to bring her breakthrough. She about to get this car. Now all of a sudden, let me try to get her to commit her suicide that she'll miss everything. Listen, come on, they got eyes, they can see. So don't, give, don't fall into the trap of the manipulation because chances are, if you're going through so much right now, I always look at my life like this. Every, tough, the, every toughest time in my life happened moments before the breakthrough came. Even in December, I was going through some crazy stuff in December, just because when we talk about spiritual warfare, man, they just gonna come at you, man. They, they, they gonna come shoot me. They ain't gonna try to come shoot you all the way like that. They gonna come get me to shut up. But the thing is, I was going through all this crazy stuff not knowing that my breakthrough was coming December 23rd, December 30th, and, and moments to come. So if you give up now, you'll miss out on what the stage was set for you for. You'll miss out on what God was even decorating his whole life for you for. So that's my two cents about that. You have anything? Yeah. And, uh, you know, the devil wants to tell you that you're insignificant yeah. and the things that you do are insignificant. Don't listen to that. You are, a, you are a significant person. You have something to offer and your plans for God are not void. They are active and they are, they are going to come to fruition. fruition. Um, and understand seasons as well. You know, a lot of times what, what happens is when you get in that mindset of, you know, I don't want to live no more, you start to compare yourself to other people's lives. You know, comparison or, um, yeah, comparison is the killer of contentment. And so, you know, a lot of times the, um, I think it's, I don't know the whole stats or anything, but most people actually commit suicide during, I think, the holiday season because they see so many people having fun with their families and they are alone. So don't compare to other people's lives. Don't compare yourselves to or have competition with somebody else because, trust me, they might have, go through, they might have been through some things that are worse than or as, not as, um, what I'm trying to say, that are worse than what you went through. And you, you can't compare your behind the scenes to someone else's highlight reel, if that makes sense. And I think that's a lot of times what we do, and then we get discouraged, and then we fall into, um, uh, you know, wanting to commit suicide. So, I want to add something about seasons as well. Um, you notice we have four seasons. We have fall, winter, spring, and summer. Spring and summer was where everything grows the most. Do you not know that the ground dies, trees die, everything die, fall going into winter? It has to die in order to bring life. So don't, don't get so concerned if you're in winter right now and it's like below 20 or you feel cold. It's like life, there's no growth, there's no green, there's no red, there's no trees, there's no blossom. Don't get so concerned because it, life is like a cycle of that. Highs and lows. People think that when you get the guy, it's going to all be highs. When I found Jesus, it's going to be number highs. Man, please, bro. <laughs> Ain't that many highs, bro. You know what I'm saying? Not that many highs in the beginning. You know what I'm saying? So, so I have to realize, but the high, the high is not in, in what I see. My high should be sustained by what he did for me. So that'll get me through those, those peaks and valleys. So remember that life is like seasons. If you're in a fall time, don't get discouraged when you see the leaves turn. When you're in winter, don't be discouraged because you don't, you, you don't have no leaves. You have nothing to produce, no fruit. 
If you just stay and fight against the wind and the rain and the season, in spring you'll blossom like you never did before. So don't, don't, don't get so discouraged in the, in the pressing time. Find some accountability. Get in the community. Find a good church. Find, find, get, it, w- w- listen, the, harder, the hardest the time, I go hard after God. I, I, have, to, I, have, to go, I have to pursue him so I, can, so I can get enough for him. So any thought that raises up against the knowledge of God, I can cast down because I have more knowledge about God than I do the situation. If you don't have no knowledge about God, how can you fight something that you have more knowledge of? Because if you don't have no faith in your heart, how can you fight things that's trying to drown your faith? If you have no, if you have no uh, knowledge of, of peace, then how can you be sustained in troubling times? If you don't have no knowledge of the spiritual things of God, then how can you fight through the natural things? Because the spiritual world is more real than the natural. Ten times, twenty times, quadrillion times more real than what you see. What the trick is to get you so consumed by what you can see. Because the Bible says faith, well, what does the scripture say? Um, Ah, uh, man. Uh, we walk by faith, not by sight. Because your sight can drown your faith. And yeah, that's about it. Next question. <laughs> How do you love yourself? Yeah, man, this is good stuff. Give me one second. Listen, man. <clears throat> man, I ain't like myself. I, I really didn't like me growing up. Um, you know, growing up in a, you know, when you were a young boy, and you told all these, these things about what you're going to be, but you look out and you, you know, you're home by yourself till your mom gets home at nine, you know what I'm saying? You have to, I played a little bass, a little bass, the big thing, I was in the band. And, you know, coming up, yeah, for real, I was getting that bass like this, bro, you know what I'm saying? But anyway, <laughs> you know, I could play this bass too, but I was playing the big bass, you know. Um, and I used to carry that thing. I mean, I grew up off Wilkinson Boulevard, so I grew up in one of the worst neighborhoods. I mean, you know, all that kind of stuff. And so I was so discouraged because I was like, man, like, you called me to do all these great things, but, but I got this big African head, you know, people picking on me, people saying, you know, I didn't have no money, so my mom had to get, uh, my, da- my dad worked at, a, not worked at a thrift shop, but he did a business, so I had worn down book bags, you know what I'm saying? I, I didn't look like the king that, that I was told to be, you know what I'm saying? I didn't look like the person that everyone says, so I used to not like myself because they had some jump man zone, some joy zone, some sequoias, what them thing back in the day, sequoias? Sacones, my bad. See, I had, a, I had a sequoias. <laughs> Y'all had a sacones. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> pay less, man, pay less. So I, you know, your shoes worn down, you know, all that kind of stuff. So going through life, but until I got to 19, I didn't really like me, man. I didn't really have female attention. So, you know, it was like, you know, when, when girls came around me, I was like, you know, you don't want to be with me because, you know, you want the pretty boy with light, light skin and all that kind of stuff. So I was this big African dude. Anyway, but, but throughout my life, by the time I got to 19, is when, see, up to 19, I was trying to be this ball player. I love basketball. I love business. There was two Bs in my life that I enjoyed, basketball and business. And when those dreams crumbled down, I saw my purpose for real. That's when I began to say I didn't really like myself in the beginning. But I grew into liking me because I found out that my, 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 my likeness, my, 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 uh, my ability to be effective is not in who I am because I don't have the degree, I don't have the, the qualifications, but when there's something supernatural working on behalf of you, it gives you such a, a, such a, a, a reason for living because, yo, God, you mean to tell me you're using me? So when I began to see God working through me, I began to like the Josh that he was developing. Not the Josh that was back then because that, that Josh is dead and gone. So, but the Josh that was being made new into the coming day, the Josh that was being made new into a newer person, I began to like him, not because of, of the progressiveness of what I was developing, but the fact that, God, you saved me even while I was yet a sinner. See, I, I dealt with the perfect complex. See, people think that, many people who know me closer, people who look at me, they think that, man, Josh got it all together. He's perfect. He's, not, he's that guy. He got everything together. Dice everywhere right across every teeth. But I had the perfect complex, and I used to get so discouraged because I wasn't this perfect man that everyone exalted me to be. So what happened was I was being exalted to the point to where when I saw myself in this way, I liked that Josh because everyone used to come at Josh for advice. They loved that Josh. But when they met this one, See, people, when they meet the real you, they don't stay there long. See, when they, they love the you, they, the people, you, you probably love me on this stage, man. That brother know how he talks. This brother good, whatever. But, but when you meet the Josh that contemplates and the Josh that is confused sometimes, the Josh that has to always go to God, when I begin to see God work through the Josh down here, I begin to get, you know, I like this Josh better than that one. Because this Josh need God more than ever. When you look at yourself far beyond that you are, or you look at yourself far less than what you should, you will always find yourself in compromised situations where you hate yourself. But when you find yourself in the hands of the God who's working on you, I like that one because he's working on me. 
But when you live the perfect complex or the inadequate complex, you'll find yourself always hating yourself. But when you find yourself, when I see God come through for me like that, while I'm still even, even when, I, when I'm not doing, when I'm not perfect, when I'm not doing, but see, it's not about perfection. See, don't try to, don't try to work. God, Christian is the only faith that you don't have to work to God. God worked to you. Buddha, Islam, all this stuff, you have to work <clears throat> to get God's attention. But God said, I, you had my attention the whole time. So I came to you. So I love the Josh that is in his hands. The other two, I don't pay that much attention to. So for you, those who want to love themselves, be caught up in the joy that you're saved. Man, I used to be that dude, man, I want millions of dollars. I wanted to be successful, Trey Song. I just want to be. And so I, I got so caught up that I just want to be successful. To the point to where, what is success on this earth when I'm not successful in the eyes of God? See, you have to make sure that you live a life of an audience of one. You don't live your audience for the people here. You don't please, because you, you I, I love it when I get that little feeling when God says, you did good, boy. Yeah, I don't care if you like it or not. I hope you like it. But when he says, you, 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 you did good, boy, that's everything because I'm doing it for him, not to please him, not to work hard so God can, like a little kid that's little, dad, did you see me? No, 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 he's like, Josh, I love you because of you, and I'm glad you're doing it on my behalf. But when you get so caught up on all these other things, man, you won't like yourself very long. So, did you want anything? You hit, hit it off? Yeah. Appreciate that, you hit it off? Yeah. <laughs> you have anything you want to add? Um, I would just say, um, and this kind of goes along with what Josh said, but the best way to learn to love yourself is to first get to know God because when you get to know God and you come to know who he is and that he's mindful of you, he thinks about you on a moment to moment basis, he cares about you and he loves you. When you come to understand who he is and how he feels about you, you really have no choice but to love yourself because if God can love you, if God can love you and he knows you better than you know yourself, then surely you can find it within you to love yourself as well. I don't see, see, many of us grew up without dads or moms, a loving home. So we oftentimes put God in the category of what our daddy was or who our mom was. So we think that God is man like, woman like. <clears throat> I don't, God is not, just many of us had dads that was too busy. Some of us had dads that wasn't there. Some of us had dads that was there but just wasn't there. So we look at God like that. We look at God as a God that's too busy. We look at a God that's there, but they're not really concerned about us. Or we look at a God that's not there. So what happened is we think that God is like what happened in our lives. But God, I don't care how busy he is, because God is the only one that's omniscient, all-knowing, omnipresent, everywhere. He's a God that can say, I actually know your problems simultaneously at one time. He is so engaging with you as he, he's engaging with you just as he's engaged with anyone else. He is the God that can do that. So he knows your problems, your problems, your concerns, your concerns, your issues, your problems at the same time and has the ability to adequately address them all. That's how good he is. And if he's that into you, then that should give you hope. When I see God come through for me, I'm like, man, I thought you was busy. You actually thought about me? God thinks about you, man. And when you know, see, the reason why evolution came into the, to thought, if you, can get, if you can get society, that's why they make your teach, they make teachers teach evolution. You have to teach it if you're a science major, whatever you are, because they want you to think, they want you to look at life as you have no creator. Creator, when you have a creator, you have identity and worth. Identity and worth. Evolution, we came from some monkeys. We came from a big bang. But I tell people, if there was a Big Bang, who was there before the Big Bang? Then who was there for the, before the Big Bang and the Big Bang? So all these different things, people get so caught up in evolution thought to the point that, well, I can, I can only live once. I'm living once. Yo, Lord, I can do whatever I want because it's the life I live. But when you know that you was created, not just made, you can make anything. I can make a picture. But when I take the time to say, let me look at these Ashleys here. <laughs> they always sit together created you in a wonderful, and he created you full of fear and full of wonder. He, he knows the hairs on your head. He knows the issues you face. He knows all these different things. And he said, if you knew, if you know deep down in your soul that I created you, not just made you one amongst millions, just threw you out. Hey, not, he didn't cast seeds. He didn't cast seeds like he put, a, put his hand in the bag and just threw seeds out and didn't know where he placed. He took one seed, planted you, took one seed, planted you. 
like a squirrel that knows where his, his uh, pecans are. He's, I'm not saying God's a squirrel, but what I'm saying is he knows where he planted you. He knows you before you even knew yourself. And when you meet that God, you'll find your self-worth and you'll find the reason why you live. And that's it, man. That's it for that question. Okay, two more. Oh, keep going? Okay. Okay. Um, how do I become more socially involved? Uh, <clears throat> to become socially involved? Um, man. Um, what do you like? You know, you got to ask yourself, what, what is it that I like? Because if, if what you like is where other people that... You, if you like certain things, the people that you're probably gonna be compatible with is gonna be in that environment as well. You know, you gotta find a place that you can get plugged in. Don't get so consumed by that, you know, I don't want, but people are gonna hurt me. Sometimes, look, man, I'm a, I'm a people person, but I'm also extrovert, I'm an introvert at the same time. I, I, like, I like to be amongst the people. Yo, what's up, y'all, how y'all doing? Man, sometimes I like to be like, y'all leave me alone because I'm chilling. So I have, I have, I have a, there's, ish, there's, there's not an issue, but <laughs> it's a balance. But the thing is, you gotta be able to say that you need people. Man, God did not create us to not have nobody. You need somebody. What's the song? Uh, we all need somebody to see that boy. <laughs> Lean on me. I can't sing, man. I know Carlton Pearson, but um, uh, y'all know that's before your time. Well, Carlton Pearson. He used to sing, sing and preach it back in the day. Or Robert's people, people back in them day, they know who they are. But what I'm saying is. Man, I've lost my train of thought, but we all need somebody to lean on. We are interdependent on each other. We need each other. So you got to find a place, ask God, God, bring some people. If you genuinely ask God for something, he'll bring it. And if you want to get plugged in here, feel free. We have some pretty nice people here, I think. Uh, so definitely feel free to get plugged in here. and help, We'll help you become socially involved. I think that's the kind of question, right? Okay. Well, I'll, I'll just add something. When you're, when you're looking to be socially involved, like Josh said, be, be careful and be prayerful um, because if you're looking to get socially involved, anybody can, like, kind of like if you're, if you're single and you're like, hey man, I want a boo, anybody will come across your path asking to be your boo. If you're looking to get socially involved, anybody will come across your path asking to be your friend. So you have to um, be prayerful and really, you know, like Josh always says, is to test the people that come in your life. And it doesn't mean that you sit them down, you know, with a pencil and a scantron and ask them 20 questions. And, you know, and test them like that. But it really just means to take the time and to get to know them um, and don't immediately give people access to you just because you're lonely and you want friends and you maybe you're in a new environment, you're in a new city and you want to get to know people better. But really, really, really take time to test people and get to know who are you? Why are you in my life? What do you want from me? You don't have to be strict like that, but you, you know, you have to um, be careful. You have to guard yourself because there could be something about you that they want um, and they're not going to give you anything. Or maybe they do give you something and it's nothing that you want or nothing that you expected. Yeah. <clears throat> and be very careful social climbers too. You know what I'm saying? I like, like for me, I got, you got to be okay with being alone at times because your friend may be in a distance. <clears throat> you know, like I said, if you have more than three friends, you are a blessed person. You are a lucky person. You're not, you're not going to have no more than three friends in your life. We're talking about friendship is, is an exchange. It's a give and take. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sustain. It's a support system. Like, not everybody's meant to be in that category. So you have to set your, you have to set your boundaries before you start trying to go out there and be socially involved because you'll meet a BFF or a friend and get so caught up in, in that person. The point is that demon in that person could be using to drain you. So it's a lot more, it's a lot more uh, difficult than what it sounds. But when you're prayerful and you're seeking God and you allow God to bring people in and you let the discernment build, you'll be able to, okay, you don't have that much access. Like I always say, I think I say this analogy a lot, but it's like a, it's like a house and a fence. Not everybody, you're not going to let anyone inside of your yard, but you let them, you'll speak to them outside the fence. Hey, Johnny, how you doing? Why are you getting the mail? But you'll let some people into your, into your yard, but you won't let them on your front porch. You'll let somebody on your front porch, but you won't let them in your house. You may let, like the mailman, you'll, you'll let people in your living room, but you won't let them in your bedroom. Bedroom is the most intimate place. That's where your friends are, your wife, your husband, the one that God has for you. Not everyone has that much, or shouldn't have that much access to your bedroom. But what I'm saying is, the more private, the more personal it becomes, they don't deserve that access. So make sure you set your rules first and determine, you know, let, examine the spirits of everyone. Examine them, discern them. Go out with them, hang out, but be very careful you don't let them into the, the, the corridors of your life. So... That's it about that. You want to answer? Yeah. And uh, my father always told me, you know, when you're around new people, always be slow to speak. 
um, always observe and listen because you'll you'll learn things um, before you know you'll learn more by just listening than always going out and just putting yourself out there and just start to talk um, and make sure you know if you're trying to get social don't do it out of desperation as well because you do that desperation you attract the wrong people um, so be comfortable and be content with being yourself as well that's the season um, so that's good stuff, man. Little young John Maxwell right here just joking. All right, last question. I'm walking the right path, but now I'm questioning everything that I do, right or wrong. My mind is going crazy. Any suggestions? Okay. <clears throat> when you start off with God, I think this is a person in the beginning stages. I'm walking the right path, but now I'm questioning everything. That's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a symptom. That's a, oh, thanks, man. That's a natural symptom <clears throat> because you're unfamiliar with the territory. You're gonna question a territory that you haven't been in. So you know, you know your sinning days, you know what I'm saying? You know your past. You can, man, man, we, we, we are so skilled at some stuff to the point that we can do that stuff like this. We can, sex is like this, doing drugs, smoking like this. We can manipulate like this, we can lie. It's, we, we got it tailor made. We know how to do it to where no one can question. We so good at it, people believe it, you know what I'm saying? But when you walk in this new path, you're gonna question everything because it's not familiar. You're not really certain about every step you take. See, when you walk in by faith, you literally, you can't really see tomorrow. Because I, for me, when I lost my job, man, <clears throat> Wells Fargo, it's almost like when you walk with God, you really, you, you can't see beyond this. Because you have to trust him with every step. So in the beginning with your walk with God, he's teaching you how to trust him in every step. So basically, when you in this life, you're going to question everything because you are unsure. Can I really, can I really, can I really be like, uh, who is it, Peter? Can I really step on this water and not sink? Can I, can I really, when he told me to come, he told me to meet him out there, but when you step on that water, you're like this. With every step, you're not just, you're not walking like this, you, you're testing it. All right, okay, I, oh, okay. But, but, but when you grow in this faith, you'll be a person that can walk on water. I mean, figuratively and literally, if you, if you got that faith, do that thing. But I'm saying, but figuratively, you, you'll be able to walk in situations more confidently. But when you're walking with God in the beginning stage, you're going to question everything, man. Because faith, faith is one of the toughest things to grasp. Without faith, the Bible says it's impossible to please him. That we walk by faith. If we mastered faith... We'll be calling fire down. We'll be raising dead because faith is, if faith, you can only, you, faith is only in one store, and that's God's store. You ain't going to be able to cultivate your faith anywhere else. Faith is one of those exclusive things. You can only get a Rolls Royce at certain places. There are certain things, you, but only when, God is the only one that can develop your faith. And, and, and when you begin to walk this walk with God, your faith becomes strengthened to the point to where you're like, yo, I can really do the impossible. Like, yo, I can really heal this person. But you can only find that faith in communion with the God who is, has, who's faithful. You're the only one. You can only find that with God. And that's why your faith gets small the further you get away from God. But, man, I remember peaks and valleys in my life where I, mean, I had strong faith. I, a young boy, six weeks old. I think it was six, not six weeks, but six days. You know, I was sick and a young man, I, had, I was on peak of my faith. I was like, man, I was like Samson in this thing. I was like, man, shoot, I got all this faith. I went to the hospital sick and all this. I healed, the, the boy was healed. Uh, the doctor said he, the baby wouldn't live. Next thing you know, uh, the, the young man came and knocked on my door and said, man, this is a young boy that you prayed for. The doctor said he wasn't gonna last for six more days or whatever days, but this kid is healed. And all these different moments where you're like, yo, you did some, you, like, whoa, you really did that. But that was when the peak of my faith. But when you begin to question and waver, it's because you're not sure about the one you've been following this whole time. But when you're sure that God got you, you'd be like Elijah. See, you know, Elijah, it's the Elijah complex. Elijah, they was, boy, they was tripping on Elijah. Either you, word, hey, dig some trenches, <clears throat> put some stones, built him a, 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 a monument, and he says, pour all the water on there. Now, you remember, they're in a drought now. They don't have no water now. So they, they took all their last water and wet this whole thing. Calls fire down. Fire consumes the water. And they start killing all these different prophets. Go read it for yourself. It's pretty dramatic. It's a pretty good story. But what I'm saying is, then you found, then Elijah heard that, uh, uh, what's her name? Uh, uh, ju not juvenile. Um, <laughs> uh, Jezebel. Jezebel. <laughs> not juvie. Uh, Je 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 Jezebel. Jezebel. Jezebel was trying to kill the man, right? And you heard the story where he found himself at the sycamore tree, talking about, God, I want to die. It's the same thing that just called fire down. You're always going to wrestle with your faith even if you had a miracle that just happened. But God who is faithful will keep you from being faithless. 
He's a God that'll keep you. Say it's okay. Don't 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 look at a God that says, "Man, you do better next time." He's not he's not a father who who he's not like the Tiger Woods dads of the world, the Michael Jordan dads of the world. They probably was good dads, but I'm saying he's not the dads in the world that's like, "Make your shot. Be perfect. Be perfect. You gotta do this," because he's the God that says, "You know what? I expected you to stumble." See, listen, you can never mess up God's plans because your mess ups are a part of His plans. You can't mess up an omniscient God's plan. So when a God puts you on a bike and says, "Let it go," He expects you to fall the first couple of times. He's going to help you steer sometimes. So don't get, disturbed. don't get discouraged when you're not executing the faith that you think you should. Be content with God, and you'll begin to say, man, I'm actually calling fire down. I'm actually doing more because I'm, I'm plugged into the source of faith, the source of the faith of my life. So that's it. Anybody else? Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, don't stress if, if, it, if it doesn't feel like that you're um, hitting perfection. You know, God doesn't... Um, he doesn't look at perfection. He looks at progression. Yeah. So he wants to know if you are progressing or not, if you're going from glory to glory. And the only way that you can do that, you cannot do it alone. If you try to do it alone, you're sunk. Um, you have to know that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You know, so the, God lives on the inside of you. So it doesn't matter, uh, you know, what you are trying to do. It doesn't matter that task that you're trying to complete. As long as you're doing it in Christ, you can do it. You can get into that school as long as you're in Christ. You can get that job as long as you're in Christ. So know that he lives on the inside of you. And I know sometimes it's, it's hard because you have uh, friends that may be doing the same things that you were doing before, that are going to the parties, that are going to um, just do whatever, and you're not doing it anymore. And it kind of feels like, man, if I, you know, is this how it is? Is this how it's going to be? But, you know, stay content. Stay content. They all have their future, and you will have yours. So stay content. And um, my bad. first off, um, you're not walking this path alone. You're not walking it alone. Now, you, it feel, you look to your left, look to your right, there's nobody there. But he's with you. And he'll bring the people that could be your support system to guide you along the way. So don't, don't be discouraged. Get plugged into a community where you can find yourself active. You got you to gotta be active, man. You got Because, man, if you left to your own thoughts, if you left to yourself, man, you are your worst enemy when you're alone. You got to be you got to be plugged in. You got to be with people because if you're not with people, man, <clears throat> you're with other entities that's surrounding you like a pack of hyenas that's that's causing you to be so terrified to the point that it devalues you in the process. So don't get so caught up on being alone. Trust that God is developing your faith. Believe that he's going to be with you and surround yourself with a support system of people that can help you when in community that can help you thrive in your in, in, in that progression. You have anything? Yeah. Um, one of the things that always kind of, um, I want to say embarrassed, I'll say humbles me when I think about faith is, um, you know, when Jesus said, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can say this mountain move and it'll be cast into the sea. Like, have you ever seen a mustard seed? Like, if you, if you haven't, Google it or go, you know, go to the grocery store and, and go to the spice aisle and actually, you know, pick some up so you can see it in real time. But mustard seeds are ridiculously small. And when you think about it, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, like that's the size of size faith that you need to move a mountain. You know, that's that's not that's not it doesn't seem like it's so much. And I think sometimes when we approach the whole the whole topic of faith, we feel like we have to have this great big faith. But Jesus says, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, and I think that's one of the things that kind of, where people kind of get tripped up because they feel like, I don't, I don't have this big faith. I don't have this massive faith. Faith the size of a mustard seed. That's it. I want to add something to that. You notice inside of, inside of every seed is a potential for us. If you remember that, then you'll understand that even though my faith is the size of a mustard seed, inside of that seed is a potential for us. So all I got to do is make sure that I'm planted in God and he becomes my sunlight. He becomes my water to sustain me that over time my faith will grow. You will not have strong faith overnight. Faith is like a muscle that has to be developed. Faith is not something that you can just say, God, give me, give me Elijah's faith. That was pretty dramatic. Give me Moses' faith. You know, give me, give me that God-like faith. And God's like, man, no, 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 no. You got you to gotta learn how to have the faith in the small things before you can have faith for the big things. You got to actually know how to have the faith to believe for $1,000. So you one day when a million-dollar bill comes, you won't, have, you won't waver. But if you never went through the stages of faith, you will never be able to walk in the big stages of faith because you haven't even been developed in the small stages. So let God develop your faith so that you'll be able to one day, you might have slipped in the water before you'll be walking on it eventually. But let's go ahead and uh, pray out. Let's give it up for our panelists. Let's give it up for them.
Thank y'all so much for coming out to Unplug. Um, right now we're gonna get in our press circle.